Meeting to order of the Saco City Council for Monday, July 26, 2021. Let the record reflect that all the councilors are present with the exception of Councilor Archer. Uh, also let the record reflect that the city administrator is present. Uh, with that, I'd like to join, uh, invite everybody to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. There's no uh, general items tonight. Any committee correspondence to council under Art uh, Section 5? No committee correspondence to council. Moving on to item 6, public comment. Any members of the public wishing to speak? On the sign-in sheet is Jane Karen. Jane, please come forward and speak to the council. Uh, please speak directly into the microphone, three minutes, announce your name and address for the record, please. Good evening, my name is Jane Karen, 264 Lincoln Street, Saco, Maine. And I'm sharing public comment from several Saco citizens who reached out to me this past week um, who could not attend this meeting, as well as my own feelings on this topic. It's in reference to the agenda items, um, item nine on tonight's agenda for D. Clare Parcel and E. Phillips Springs Road Parcel. And at the last council meeting, July 12th of 2021, there was a request for from my understanding, a complete inventory of city-owned property that could be compiled, and then a collaborative meeting of all city department heads, including the um, school board construction committee, to discuss future needs of the city of Saco as it pertains to the need or use of this land. Um, per the packet provided, the council, um, I believe the, the council voted on this, but in the packet, I believe the city administrator did meet with department heads on July 20th. Um, however, I don't believe the school committee was involved in that, but I'm unclear on that. Um, and it is noted also that in the past there was a note from the fire um, department that setting aside land seems to be a prudent action. That was a comment once made, so I don't know if that has changed. I would like to see some formal documentation on that. Um, and it, it, this um, packet also referred only to the Clare parcel, the note on, on the meeting. It didn't refer to the Phillips Spring Road parcel. So I, in summary, I'm asking that the council please consider strongly voting against the sale of the Clare and Phillips Spring Road properties at this time. And until some very serious decisions are made for the city of Saco, namely for the school, with the new school issue coming up, as well as the fire department in the future. Those two have to be, I think, a priority for the city at this time. And the land could be sold later on. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment this evening? Moving on from public comment. <clears throat> that brings us to approval of the minutes for July 12th, 2021. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. So, Councilor McPhail, is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Berman. Any discussion? Roll call vote on approving the minutes. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councillor Berman? Yes. Councillor Hatch? Yes. Councillor McPhail? Yes. Councillor Johnston? No. The motion passes 5-1. Brings us to item eight, consent items. Uh, A, to approve the schedule for the August and September meeting dated, excuse me, meeting dates, page two in the packet. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. 
Councillor Johnston, is there a second? Second. Second by Councillor Purdy. Any discussion? Roll call vote to approve the consent items. Councillor Purdy? Yes. Councillor Gunn? Yes. Councillor Berman? Yes. Councillor Hatch? Yes. Councillor McPhail? Yes. Councillor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. Brings us to action items. <clears throat> Item A, a public hearing, Chapter 176, Sewer Ordinance. Councillor McPhail. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Since the summer of 2019, the WRRD staff and the consultants have been rewriting Chapter 176 of the, of the City Ordinances. This proposed rewrite better aligns the City's local ordinance with state requirements of its main pollutant discharge elimination system, otherwise known as MEDDES, permit federal requirements of the Clean Water Act and best practices from the EPA. This revision incorporates an updated impact fee schedule and other revisions based on months of research. I move to open the public hearing the following order. Regarding the following order in substantially the same form as presented, be it ordered that the City Council repeals existing Chapter 176 of the City Ordinances and hereby ordains that redrafted Chapter 176 as presented at the public hearing and shall be adopted in place of the existing ordinance in its entirety. Motion's been made by Councillor McPhail. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councillor Hatch. Any discussion? Roll call vote to open the public hearing. Councillor Purdy? Yes. Councillor Gunn? Yes. Councillor Berman? Yes. Councillor Hatch? Yes. Councillor McPhail? Yes. Councillor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6 0 at 6 36 p.m. Those wishing to speak on the matter, please come forward and be heard. Seeing nobody coming forward, Councillor McPhail. Thank you. I move to close the public hearing and schedule the final reading on August 23rd, 2021, regarding the following order in substantially the same form as presented. Be it ordered that the City Council repeals existing Chapter 176 of the City's ordinances and hereby ordains that redrafted Chapter 176 as presented at the public hearing shall be adopted in place of the existing ordinance in its entirety. Motion's been made by Councillor McPhail. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councillor Berman. Any discussion? Roll call vote. <clears throat> Councillor Purdy? Yes. Councillor Gunn? Yes. Councillor Berman? Yes. Councillor Hatch? Yes. Councillor McPhail? Yes. Councillor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. Close the public hearing at 6 38. That brings us to item B, a first reading, Article 19, Historic Preservation Amendments, on page 68 in the packet, Councillor Gunn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. At their meeting on September 23, 2020, the HPC directed staff to initiate the process to amend the Historic Preservation Chapter of the Zoning Ordinance, previously known as Chapters 230 through 413, now known as Article 19. The HPC has spent the uh, past several months discussing and workshopping proposed changes. Highlights of the proposed changes include ability for the City Council to create a, quote, historic landscape district, unquote, in order to protect historically and culturally significant parks and open spaces. Requirements for landmarks listed on the National Registry of Historic Places to undergo Certificate of Appropriateness review for qualified exterior changes. Specific material preferences for new construction are now noted. Additional clarification regarding which exterior changes require certificate of appropriateness review. Requirement for changes to public improvements, for example, sidewalks, within the historic district to undergo certificate of appropriateness review. The Historic Preservation Commission held a public hearing on these proposed changes during their meeting on April 14th, 2021 and voted unanimously to forward a positive recommendation to the City Council for ad adoption of the amendments as drafted. The Planning Board held a public hearing on the proposed changes during their meeting on June 1, 2021, and voted unanimously to forward a positive recommendation for adoption of the amendments, but noted that they recommended removing 72 Grant Road property from the list of National Register listed properties that would require local review. 
The staff recommends that the council discuss the proposed changes, make recommendations for any changes that they would like, wish to see, and schedule a public hearing for August 9th, 2021. I move to approve the first reading and schedule a public hearing on proposed amendments to Article 19 of the Zoning Ordinance for August 9th, 2021. Motion's been made by Councilor Gunn. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor McPhail. Any discussion? Mr. Mayor. Councilor Johnston. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, given that it's my actual residence, that's one of the properties slated to be added to the HPC and I'm also directly connected to several of, the, of these properties, um, I'll be recusing myself from further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnston. Any further discussion? Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I um, have concerns with expanding the HPC district outside of the um, downtown area, but uh, not necessarily completely against it. I am certainly want to move this forward to the public hearing, but um, I am not going to make the amendment tonight, but I did want my fellow councilors to be aware that I will be um, making an amendment to uh, remove 72 Grant Road from, from the list uh, down the road. not going to offer it tonight because I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to uh, to hear the public hearing and, uh, and study the, the situation more. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Purdy. Any further discussion? Councilor Berman? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm generally in favor of, of uh, this effort. I do have two small notes, uh, fairly technical, on the text itself. And one is on page 72 of our packet, section B1B. The Saco Historic Preservation Design Manual 2010, or most recent edition, reads like one would have a choice as the 2010 or most recent edition. And I wonder if the intent isn't to always use the most recent edition. Uh, the second is on page 73, section 3C, number 3. Uh, in most cases, this document has been amended to refer to districts, which will be the purpose uh, after this is passed. But here it says at least one member of the commission shall be a resident of the historic district. And I wonder if that should be made plural also. Thank you, Councilor Berman. Any further discussion? Roll call vote. Councilor Purdy. Yes. Councilor Gunn. Yes. Councilor Berman. Yes. Councillor Hatch. Yes. Councillor McPhail. Yes. Councillor Johnston. Stain. Motion passes five, zero, zero. That brings us to item C, a final reading zoning ordinance amendment request to terminate contract zone at 401 Main Street on page 323 of the packet. That's Councillor Johnston. The owners of the property at 401 Main Street request that the contract zone agreement that allowed a personal services business to be operated by Acapello Salons, Inc. be terminated. Just as the contract zone represents an amendment to the zoning ordinance, the proposed termination is also an amendment to the ordinance for which City Council review and approval is necessary. The contract zone was approved by the Council on Jan January 17, 2006. Acapello was open at this location until 2019 when the business moved to 510 Main Street. With the termination, zoning would return to the underlying and adjacent medium density residential zone. <clears throat> um, amendments to the zoning map in this chapter made under this section may be amended or repealed by the City Council. Staff supports the termination of this contract zone as proposed by the applicant. Um, I think I'm actually going to allow another councilor to make the motion because I, at this point in time, I'm not comfortable making it. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Is there a council that's willing to make the motion? Mr. Mayor, I will. Councillor McPhail. I move to approve the second and final reading and to amend the zoning ordinance by granting the requested termination of the contract zone by and between Acapella Salons, Inc. and the City of Saco. Motion's been made by Councillor McPhail. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councillor Gunn. Discussion. 
Councillor Johnston. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, still kind of rather conflicted on this. Um, I mean, on one hand, I fully understand where Ms. Giuliano is coming from, and the request seems kind of simple. Uh, however, at the same time, you know, I can't get past this feeling that somehow the city is, is doing wrong to another party. Uh, when you look at the contract zone specifically, in sections 2E, uh, you know, it, it states that the agreement shall, without fee or charge, provide church members with parking privileges. <clears throat> shall to me is, is rather, that, that was a directive or an order by the city council at the time. Um, so in, in many ways, we gave a benefit to, in this particular case, the, the church members. Um, and it further goes on in section three to again mention this parking agreement, but it actually mentions what, what met the test as far as the contract zone for the unusualness uh, or the unique nature of it was that they had the ability to help offset the parking issues. Uh, so again, you know, if, if this worked at the time and, and the applicant or the property owner was okay with it when financially it made sense to them, um, it's a bit concerning to me that we can turn around 15 years later, or however long it is, um, and now say, well, it doesn't work for me. In the meantime, we have a separate party that, again, the city has, through this agreement, extended a parking agreement to. So I feel like we're doing, you know, it's, it's, it's a bait and switch to me. And, and that's the problem I'm having with it. I don't, I don't know if there's legal ramifications. I, I think I asked that previously. I don't know if, if the church themselves would pursue that. Um, but I kind of think that this highlights many of the other issues with contract zones in, in general. And, and then it, it's concerning to me that, again, moving forward, we do this, how many others will come forward? I mean, I can think of, geez, several handfuls that I've been a part of on my time on council where they all had some of these real specific uh, requirements. So are we gonna be here in the future where because that applicant says, well, I don't want that anymore. So get rid of it, and council just on a whim says, sure, in the, mean, in, in the meantime, you impact these other uh, individuals or, or the public as, at large as a whole. Um, I mean, our contract zones in general are supposed to have public you know, uh, benefit. I mean, that's, that's the state law itself. I'm not saying that many of the, the city of Saco ones, uh, you know, whether I've been a part of or, or prior, always had them. They should have. I think that's something I've been consistent on at least my time on council. And I think in this particular case, um, knowing individuals that were involved at the time, um, that was the intent here. And I think that's what Mr. Attorney Murphy really was stating last week or two weeks ago, uh, that, that the intent here was a win-win for everybody at the time. Again, so it's concerning to me that now in 2021, it's, it's no longer wanted and we just should do away with it when Again, you're going to put all that traffic back onto the Cleveland neighborhood, and you'll have a, a church that um, has enjoyed this benefit for 15 plus years. I mean, I don't know. Maybe they lose members of their church because they can't find adequate parking. And I, like I said, I, me, it's it's difficult, really, where or how to you know, move forward with this. I, I wish two parties could, you know, come to some kind of agreement by themselves, but. I don't really like the position that the, the city's in. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Johnston. Councilor Berman. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I agree with Councilor Johnston that I don't like the position the city is in. I'm also uh, concerned about the level of detail put in, into this contract zone. But, but as I read through this packet, and I appreciate the level of detail, it kept uh, seeming to me that there were a variety of different issues one was an agreement between two neighbors, two parties, who'd reached an arrangement that was mutually beneficial regarding drainage and parking. One that, as Councilor Johnson described, was at one time a win-win, uh, but no longer is. There were also some issues uh, about planning board and site plan review, but those aren't the issues in front of us, nor do I think that the dispute between the neighbors should be the issue in front of us. It seems to me that the only issue in front of the council tonight is one about whether this contract zone should persist. And this contract zone was to allow a full service salon and spa business to exist at 401 Main Street. 
that business no longer exists at 401 Main Street. I can't see any benefit after that in maintaining a contract zone that would require a business to remain in existence when it simply no longer is. Thank you, Councillor Berman. Councillor Hatch, then Councillor McPhail. Councillor Hatch. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to agree with uh, Councillor Berman on his position here, and, and I'm, I'm looking at the parking easement that was recorded in the Registry of Deeds, executed between uh, the church and uh, Ms. Giuliano. And if you reference uh, paragraph 7, uh, it clearly states both parties agree that if the use of the grantor's property is ever converted to a single family residence, or if the contract zone agreement by and between the two party, uh, between Acapello and the city of Saco uh, is terminated, this easement and all rights shall terminate. Um, they both agreed to that. And so uh, I'm sitting here agreeing with Councillor Berman, uh, I think our, our issue is, is contract zone, not the agreement between the two parties, which clearly, I think, both parties agreed that if there was a, uh, if, if it did resort back to single family residence, that the, the parking arrangement would disappear. I suspect that uh, prior to this agreement, the church was parking and there wasn't, you know, I'm sure there were challenges, but uh, it wasn't an insurmountable challenge. So um, I think we ought to, you know, ref. Thank you, Councillor Hatch. Councillor McPhail. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, exactly, basically what Phil just said, um, but we also need to consider, too, that it doesn't put the city in a difficult position because Ms. Giuliano and the church are having their own legal proceedings to work on the easement. Um, it is not a city issue. It is not a city responsibility. The contract zone is simply allowing it to be single family residence only again. Um, and as far as parking on Cleveland in summer, I live down in that area. That is my ward. I've seen it with the church for years. Um, it is such a limited time span that I don't consider it a problem on the street. The church members come. They come for an hour, an hour and a half, one day a week, Sunday morning, no traffic. Um, so it. it, it I don't consider it to be a hardship for those two streets. Um, every church has the same issue, um, and side streets and um, areas are used. So I, I think that this is something that Ms. Giuliano, as the property owner, has a right to request, and um, this is what she would like to have done with it. And the business is gone and has moved, and the purpose is gone. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor McPhail. Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion on the item, a roll call vote on the item. Councillor Purdy. Yes. Councillor Gunn. Yes. Councillor Berman. Yes. Councillor Hatch. Yes. Councillor McPhail. Yes. Councillor Johnston. No. Motion passes 5-1. That brings us to item D, a final reading, chapter 81, conveyance of city-owned property, Claire Parcels, page 404, your packet. Councillor McPhail. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On July 23rd, 2018, the City Council approved the purchase of 841 to 853 Portland Road, known as the Claire Parcels, with the intent of building a new industrial park. The cost of the parcels totaled $675,455,000. Since the purchase of these properties, the City has completed a wetland delineation of the property and submitted an inquiry to the EDA regarding grant funding for building a new road into the property. However, since there were still parcels available within the Millbrook Business Park and new parcels being created on Phillips Spring Road, developing this area into a new business industrial park for the city has not been a top priority over the past two years. In January of 2021, the city adopted a market analysis and action plan matrix completed by Cami and Associates. This plan directly addresses the questions of expanding city business industrial parks based on data and economic trends and forecast. The market analysis found that the supply of industrial space in the region continues to be limited and the demand for that type of space is moderate. There are growth opportunities in the cross-section of logistics and manufacturing, 
However, this demand is not significant enough to justify an expansion of Saco's business parks, considering the availability of privately owned sites on the market currently. Therefore, the recommendation is to focus on attracting businesses within the opportunity sectors to existing park properties. Do not expand business parks and dedicate resources to attracting amenities to the parks. This item was reviewed by the Planning Board at its June 15, 2021 meeting. The Board voted 4-0 to forward a positive recommendation for the sale of lots as outlined in Chapter 81 of the City Code. At the request of Council, the City Administration met with the City Department's heads on July 20th to discuss potential public uses for the property. No department head expressed a desire to maintain the property. However, Howard Carter did request that the city retain a utility easement along a portion of Route 1 for odor control equipment. I move to authorize the city administrator to sell 80, 841 to 853 Portland Road. Thank you, Councillor McPhail. Is, is there a second? Second. Second by Councillor Purdy. City Administrator Ken Rath, did you want to say something? I did, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we did have our meeting, uh, department head level, on uh, uh, July 20th. Um, Chief Duros was not able to attend that meeting, so I wanted to relay his comments also. Um, as you may have heard in the past, uh, that location is um, a location that could work for a satellite public safety facility. However, a, a more northerly location is desired. Uh, as you know, sort of more towards the Scarborough Line or the Waterfall Drive area. So his basic uh, comments are it could work for a satellite public safety facility, but it's not uh, ideal. Um, I'll also say something, also we heard uh, something in public comment uh, this evening. If there is further interest in a more formal meeting with the, the school board perhaps or the school department, um, we could do that. Um, if that really is the desire of the council, I would recommend tabling that uh, until next week um, or perhaps later. Uh, but we did conduct this meeting at the staff department level. Uh, and in, we had uh, Howard's um, one possible small uh, postage stamp size uh, use for there, and as well as uh, Chief DeRoss's comments that it is possible but not ideal. Thank you, City Administrator Canrath. Uh, any discussion? Councilor Johnston, then Councilor Hatch. Councilor Johnston. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I have too much more to add. I think I've, I've said quite a bit over the last several weeks, um, and, and the administrator just addressed at least one of my, my concerns uh, prior to the meeting. Um, I will say that the school construction committee was just formed a week ago. Uh, we've yet to meet, and uh, my understanding, speaking with Superintendent Ray, is that the selection, land selection process probably will begin sometime in mid-August. Um, I, I think I've said previously that me personally, I think land banking, this land for future uses, regardless of whether a department head feels as though it's needed today. You know, as I said previously, nobody knew that we were gonna need the land in front of Joan Dynamics for a fire, new central fire department in 1993 or five when it was purchased. It was just available and offered to the city. Um, so it is a bit concerning that we would sit here and, and not be able to like look forward 10 years and say, hey, there is a possibility. We just heard from the fire chief that say, it might not be ideal, but there's a possibility. Um, again, I don't think it's ideal, necessarily the most ideal location for a school, but um, having gone through a prior school construction process, uh, it was very clear to me that there's not many large tracts of land left in the city of Saco located near sewer and water um, that's suitable for for a school, and, and that was 2015, and now in 2021, I can think of several properties we looked at at the time that are no longer available. Um, so again, I think that you know this council would be foolish to move forward selling this land, um, at least today. I, I, you know, if we want to take this back up in six months, a year from now, at the very least, we should get through that uh, school selection site, you know, and then you know, move forward from there and say, hey, uh, let's offer it for sale. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnston. Councillor Hatch and Councillors, can you just remember to speak into the microphone so everyone can hear you uh, in here and also at home? Thank you. I, I would like to express uh, support of uh, Councillor um, Johnston's comments. Uh, I, I really uh, would love to uh, deal with this once it has been fully vetted. I think the, uh, the school issue is an, an important one, and I think that uh, we should uh, provide enough time to allow that whole process to unfold 
and to, um, to make sure that the properties in question here uh, are, are not viable for, for city use. And I'm not sure, I'm feeling comfortable at this point that we're there. So I, I can see no problem uh, with a slight you know, delay uh, on this decision. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hatch. Any further discussion, Councillor Berman? Good. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Could either the, the city administrator or perhaps the city planner uh, remind us whether there is any timeliness or urgency to these sales? Um, I'll, let the, I'll let the city planner or Jessa speak on this, but um, it's, um, I don't think there's any extreme timeliness, but I know there are potentially uh, interested buyers out there um, that have approached the city. But uh, Bob or Jessa? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, no, no time constraints at all that I'm aware of. And, and uh, Jessa Berna uh, from our Economic Development and Planning Department reiterated, yeah, no, no deadlines. Uh, we, we, we need not uh, move those properties within six weeks, months, or years. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Councilor Johnson. Thank you. I, I would just add, you know, for council to understand that if a prospective buyer came, we could deal with it then, as I said several weeks ago. Um, so if there is a, a potential buyer out there, they could obviously make an offer to the city. Any further discussion? No, hearing no further discussion. Uh, roll call vote on the item. Final reading, conveyance of city-owned property, Claire Parcels. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? No. Councilor Hatch? No. Councilor McPhail? For this one, no. Councilor Johnston? No. The motion uh, fails 4 3, or 4 2, excuse me. Item E, final reading, Chapter 81, Conveyance of City Owned Property, page 406 in the packet, Phillips Spring Road, Councillor McPhail. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The city is considering whether to convey two of the four parcels created when the Planning Board approved the Spil Spring Hill Industrial Park expansion plan on 7 9 19. As described in the Planning Board approval, the Spring Hill Industrial Park expansion, Philip Spring Road, has a project area of approximately 42 acres. The proposal is to create a total of four lots, one of which is designed for the new public works facility and others which are proposed to be sold at a future date for development purposes. The lots proposed for sale are, two lot, are lots two and three because they are currently buildable lots with frontage on Philip Spring Road. These lots are between 5.4 acres and 6 acres in area. This item was reviewed by the Planning Board at its June 15, 2021 meeting, and the Board voted 4-0 to zero to forward a positive recommendation for the sale of the lots as outlined in Chapter 81 of the City Code. I move to authorize the City Administrator to sell lots 2 and 3 in the Phillips Spring subdivision. Motion's been made by Councillor McPhail. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councillor Purdy. Any discussion? Councillor Johnston. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, again, I think you could copy and paste what I previously said. Um, I do, however, I, I think as I've indicated previously, um, I feel that these lots are, are probably likely to be sold as commercial lots, but um, there was discussion amongst some of us in the past that you, know, you could potentially build a school campus off the back end of these properties, you know, which presently is owned by Another, another property owner, but they obviously were uh, willing to sell off land to the city for the DPW garage. So uh, I just I think again this is an example where let's get through a process and then move forward with selling these um, if that's what we do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnston. Any further discussion? Councillor Berman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the other properties had some interest, perhaps, from the fire chief about a public works satellite facility. 
Was there any such interest in these properties? I'm sorry, just to clarify, is that a public works satellite for public safety? Right, there was some interest in the, for the Clare properties for uh, perhaps a satellite fire station. Correct. Is there any similar interest for these properties? I don't believe so. Any further discussion? <coughs> Seeing no hands raised, roll call vote. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor Hatch? No. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnston? No. Motion passes 4 2. Brings us to item F, a final reading, a blanket waiver of covenants for all business parks to add emergency use as permitted, the use for the Saco Schools. Councillor Purdy, page 437 in your packet. The Saco School Department is looking at temporary locations for schools while they await funding for a permanent larger school. Some of the lots that the school department was interested in pursuing are located within the city's business and industrial parks. Covenants for Spring Hill and Millbrook Business Parks do not currently allow schools as a permitted use. Denise Clavette, Director of Planning and Economic Development, met with a group looking at potential sites and after discussion recommended that the school department approach the Economic Development Commission and the City Council to pursue a blanket waiver of all business and industrial parks at emergency use for schools as a permitted use. Kevin Roach, who represented the schools at the Economic Development Commission meeting held on April 12, 2021, emphasized this amendment is needed to allow the schools to consider properties in the business parks in emergencies. On April 12, 2021, the Economic Development Commission unanimously voted to recommend to Council a blanket waiver of covenants for all business parks to add emergency use for school Saco School Department and Thornton Academy as a permitted use subject to legal review and amendment language developed by the city attorney. On May 24, 2021, city staff addressed city council questions on the blanket waiver, received guidance from council on pursuing the blanket waiver. City staff consulted with legal counsel to develop amendment language and process for the amendment. Of note, the school department may not need to locate in the business parks, but a waiver would be a good option to have should the need arise. As the City Council, first reading on June 28th, the City Council requested that the amended covenants be revised to define emergency use and add a term length. The revised covenants are, have been included. I move to amend the Millbrook Business Park Covenants and the Spring Hill Business Park Covenants as shown in Exhibits 1 and Exhibit 2. Two. Motion's been made by Councillor Purdy. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councillor Gunn. Any discussion? Councillor Berman? Uh, I just wanted to express thanks for the changes that were made in response to some council concerns. I had addressed all my concerns and I really appreciate the efforts. Any further discussions? Seeing no further discussions, roll call vote. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor Hatch? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. Uh, that brings us to item 10 of the agenda new business 10A, a contract zone request for 63 Store Street, 511 in your packet. And will we be he hearing from uh, Isabel? Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Um, so this was a uh, request for contract zone for 63 Store Street. Um, I wrote a memo in your packet, which should have been provided. The um, the crux of the issue here is that the applicant is hoping to increase the density of the property. Um, he currently has eight units at the property and a vacant commercial space that he's been trying to fill. Um, he is hoping to uh, have a contract zone to do four additional properties. Um, so it would be a, a change to the lot area per dwelling unit requirement in the uh, specific to 63 store. 
Um, he's also hoping for a um, change to the parking requirements in the zone. So typically, um, you would be required to have um, one to 1.5 parking spaces for every unit, as well as an additional guest space. He is hoping to have a um, change to those requirements to do um, 11 parking spaces on the property. This was something that was allowed under the previous zoning ordinance um, in certain zones within the city, which this one would have fallen into. So he is hoping for a, a change to the parking so that he would only have to have 11 spaces. Um, the applicant's also here to answer any questions if you have any for him. Thank you, Isabel. Would you like to bring up the applicant and introduce him to the council? Sure. Thank you. Um, so this is Alex Babish. Babish. Um, he is the owner of the property at 63 Store Street. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council. Council, any questions? Councilor Berman. Have you been trying to find another restaurant or other business to take over the first floor? Yeah, How's yeah. How's that been going? Um, my brother and I uh, bought the place a couple of years ago, and we put quite a bit of money into the restaurant space, really hoping that we would get someone new. Um, BB's Burritos had just been evicted as we um, took ownership of the property. The old owner um, evicted them. And... Uh, it was quite a process. Like pre-COVID, we had a lot of interest, um, but no one quite bit due to the size of the property. It's a, it's a really big space. I don't know how many of you have been in there, but um, it's over 3,000 square feet. And you know, due to kind of the neighborhood, it's a little bit off the beaten path. There's not a lot of visibility there. And um, yeah, so we were pretty close to signing on one of the, you know, kind of. Uh, bigger restaurant tours in Portland, but he backed out at the end. And after that, there was really no one that I was interested in or seemed really serious. And then COVID hit and interest kind of dropped off. So there really wasn't anything after that. Any further questions? Well, I don't, I don't have questions, I have comments, but. Okay. Alex, maybe I missed it in the packet. Uh, does the property come with the parking lot across the street from the from the uh, the house or, or the restaurant? Yes, that that's a separate parcel, but it was included in the sale. Yeah. And what do you plan to do with that, or is that part of the parking that you would like to increase? That I would like to kind of keep separate, if possible, due to you know the future development potential there. I I don't know. I really like downtown areas. I like being able to walk places, and I think there's you know, a higher and better use than a parking lot in the long term there, so. Thank you. Any further questions for Isabel or for Alex? Thank you, Alex. Thank you for having me. Any general comments? Councilor Johnston? Thank you. Um, well, well, first, I do need to disclose that I am a, a butter, um, but again, I, I spoke as a public hearing for the planning board. I don't see this as a conflict by any way. Um, but I will say that I think when you look at, at your standards for a contract zone, this is really uh, rather an inappropriate use. Um, it, it doesn't meet the standards. I think that was clearly what the planning board uh, specified in their findings. Uh, there was nothing unique or special about this property. Uh, it's just another downtown property that really, honestly, I can tell you, has the exact same problems that many other downtown properties do. Um, but I, I am supportive of the density increase, and this is what I said at the, at the public hearing for the planning board. Um, when we go back, and I don't even bore everybody to death with this, I feel like I've said this multiple times in the last seven months. Uh, when we go back to that zoning ordinance revision for the downtown specifically, we at the time had not applicable we didn't have any requirement. It wasn't until very late into the process, our final planning board meeting, that the attorney um, basically said, you can't have NA. So we started this long process of going, you know, what's the density going to be? So ultimately, at that moment, I said, hey, you know, we merged two zones. The average, whoa, was 1,500 square feet. Let's just go with that, and we'll address it in a subsequent amendment. 
So, you know, seven months later, we already had one similar contract zone that came forward for the former or the current Sweetser block. At least with that one, you could look at it and say, well, it's a historic property that needed this, you know, for adaptive reuse. It also was unique in that it had its own parking lot across the river from it. Uh, so it was a stretch, but it, it met it. And I was hoping that, you know, before any more of these came up, we would just correct the zoning ordinance. And, and that's what I had said at the planning board meeting. Um, I was hopeful that it would be before this council and the planning board to, to correct this issue, because really that's, that's really the issue here for, for this applicant. It, it's really specific to that min um, area per dwelling unit. Um, and again, I, 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 I'm sympathetic. I, I myself have a, a single family home uh, that's a rental that when I bought it, I looked at it and said, well, maybe I can get two or three units out of it, but under the current zoning ordinance, I can't. Um, you know, there's, there's the corner lot on store on Main Street that my father owns that, ready for this one, this is shocking, you can build 60 feet in the air under the current ordinance, but based on this standard, he could only put three units on it. It's never gonna happen. Um, so really, we need to address this issue um, and not through the contract zone. I mean, the parking issue, I have my own you know, feelings on that. I, I expressed previously that you can't create your own hardship, and in this particular case, you have an applicant that owns a parking. If you want to develop it, you deal with that later on, right? Not now. Um, you can meet the standard presently with that other parcel, but honestly, as, as the planner said at the planning board meeting, uh, that's really a function of site plan. It's, it really has less to do about the zoning ordinance um, so really that's not so much uh, something that should be before us. Um, so I know that, oh goodness, I think it's section 209 of, of the charter allows for you know, a city councilor to, to introduce a, a, an ordinance. So I'm asking again at this time through the city administrator that we address this through an amendment to the zoning ordinance and I really don't think that this council should even move this request forward past this evening. Let's just fix the problem. Because I can assure you, as I said at the planning board meeting, I'm probably gonna be the next in line asking for the same thing or, or, or other properties I'm, I'm involved with because they all have the same challenge. So let's just fix it. Let's not continually just throw contract zones everywhere when they're not appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Johnston. Any further discussion? Is there any counselor willing to bring this forward uh, at a, for a first reading? Okay. Doesn't seem that there's council support for this. Uh, we are moving on. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your time. Brings us to item B, an EPA AAA update and presentation, page 526 in your packet. And I think we're gonna be joined by Director Carter. And Compliance Manager Cole Prescott. Howard Emily, I don't know if we want to turn one of these monitors towards the council so they can, I don't, you guys, can you see on that side or is that okay? Or? We have that one facing the audience. That, one on the right. yeah. that one's facing. Yeah. Does this work for you guys? Okay. And just make sure those mics are working too, I'm not sure. Yeah. I 
I want to thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council, for having us tonight. This is uh, something that we've been working on for at least two years now, and after the study, we'd like to uh, present this out to you. Um, I think the first thing we're going to do is Emily's going to bring up a little uh, video that we shot well, it was a couple of years ago now, but I'm just going to go through part of it. So this is, this is a view of the, of the facility uh, shot by the uh, communication department. We happen to have a high tide at this particular time. As you can see, the river is fairly close up to the driveway. And also during this day, uh, we had 13 million gallons a day coming into the treatment plant with four inches of rain. And right there in that circular structure is actually where the water comes into the plant from both sides of the city. That would be from Route 1 or its combined system going out to the industrial park and also from the east side that goes down to uh, Camp Ellis area. Now you can see it's cascading over. This, this section is called the headworks. This is where the water comes in and that's where we take away a lot of our grease and our rags and stuff and that's almost overflowing. If you want to stop right there for a second, Emily. This is, our, this is our primary clarifier and a splitter box where you can see that the water is actually cascading out, going down and running directly to the river without treatment. So certainly that, if you go to the uh, city website under the WRID and go under resiliency, you can see this full video and I actually have a voiceover on that explaining, explaining all the things happening. But there's, that shot pretty much tells it all, everything's full. The tide's so high that the, the flow cannot leave the treatment plant and it's, it's running all over the driveway. Um, just prior to that, we had started a resiliency study just because of these things, because every year it seems to be getting worse and worse and worse. Um, so we, we, we've seen the tide rise and there's no question about it. Um, so on the next step, the next slide, I'll go back one. We actually, the main climate council and the governor's panel knows about this, knows about this, uh, this facility and it's certainly one of their critical infrastructures in peril. And, and they had an estimated repair to this facility if we lost it because of a storm at about $43 million. Uh, next one. So just a little bit of history. Like I said earlier, we started the climate adaption plan uh, around 2019. Then in 2020, we were approached by the US EPA wanting to know if we wanted to partner with them on this augmented analysis. And we said, sure, we'd do that because we were looking at a couple different ways to, uh, to uh, go about an upgrade. And then the mayor and the council, you, you formed the Coastal Resiliency Committee. I know Council McPhail was on it and, and, and Mayor Doyle participated on it as well. And then just recently we completed the AAA evaluation. And what I'll do is I'll give you a high level view of really what came out of it. Okay. So again, a lot of this stuff comes down to what, what we call in the wastewater world is the triple bottom line. You, you get the social, economic, environmental impacts of what we do, Sp especially the economic, that would be your economic development, business growth, community growth. The social will be certainly public health. Um, that's the biggest thing that we're really here for is public health more than anything else. And the recreation along the river, of course, you've got the kayakers, you've got the lobstermen and the rest of it. And finally, protection of our biggest resources, the Saco River, from, from any times of pollution or any emergent pollutions of concern going forward. So there's 10 steps involved actually with, with going through the AAA process. I'll just touch on real qu quickly. And that's understanding the, the community priorities. We set them early in the process determine the project goals, define the objectives, rank the importance of the goals, establish criteria, choose metrics for your criteria, create performance ranges, evaluate performance of each alternative, compare across the alternatives, and incorporate cost considerations. So there's really the number one thing that the uh, that the stakeholder group identified was to improve system resiliency. That was number one on the list. But number two, of course, would be ensure that we have financial stability in order to afford it. Third was improve ecological and environmental health of the river. Increase the public awareness and appreciation of the value of the, value of the water services. 
And that's that we're trying to do. You see a lot of our videos coming out. We started that. And finally, bolster community livability. This, this project also takes in a lot of work on the river walk and, and, and adding some amenities down by the treatment plant. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Emily for a minute. She's gonna go through some of the, uh, some of the uh, community priorities and how we rated those or ranked those. So if you look at the community priorities that we just went through, many of them align uh, with some of the council goals and focus areas. And so it was nice to see that there was some synergy among the project goals as well as the community uh, perspectives and the council focus areas. And so using those goals, we're just gonna walk you through two, uh, two goals that we built out metrics for, and there are many more that you'll see toward the end of the presentation, but this was a great way to understand how a site alternative either met or did not meet what the community wanted to see for the long-term health of the facility. So in this case, using improving system resiliency for environmental health, the objective was to protect the facility from flooding, the changing climate, and extreme weather events. And we, one of our criteria to measure that was reducing potential for the facility flooding and treatment capacity impacts. And when we looked at the metric level of that and figuring out how we're going to, uh, how we're going to score this on a performance range, we looked at the elevations of site alternatives above the 100-year flood elevation. So a negative five indicated that we had zero foot above this flood elevation, so we had zero ability basically to protect the facility from future flooding, all the way to a positive five, which was ability to protect for five feet of 100-year flood elevation. So Feel free to ask any questions along the line. We can make this interactive. So on the next goal, we looked at financial stability, and it was really important that uh, the three economic, social, and environmental factors were balanced when we look at this project, and that's part of the bottom line of the AAA process. So on this goal, we looked to maximize grant funding opportunities, and we looked at the site alternatives to determine if there were opportunities to gain or to uh, be awarded grants, what on the site would be grant worthy? And we've, that's a continual process that we've gone through. But our criteria here was to actively explore and pursue the appropriate grant funding opportunities. And then we looked at the likelihood of success in obtaining those grant funding. So in, in lieu of having a long presentation tonight, we've given you the link where you can go and see all of the goals built down to the metric level. And you'll see some of them are like this, with no likelihood, medium likelihood, or a high. Um, and then some of them will be with this type of scoring range where we actually have a certain value assigned. So from there, we went and we looked at our site alternatives. And so I'll hand it back to Howard here to go over each of the site alternatives that we reviewed. So as you can see, alternative zero was the do nothing alternative. Alternative, excuse me. There'd be no changes or updates to the WRRF other than usual maintenance. Um, the estimated cost damage is up to 43 million. I think it's important to note too, it's just not sea level rise. As the sea comes up, it's also if you have like a type one hurricane in the right direction, we can really get inundated water, kind of like Super Storm Sandy did down in New Jersey and Rhode Island. And the existing and potential flooding, all that area inside the purple, to the river is all is subject to flooding now and it's just getting worse. And also down another area of concern is down by the boat launch on Front Street. That area floods out now on a real high tide. And and we're right now unable to to uh, to uh, meet the future growth of the community. Um, we've had a couple of businesses come in the last few years, is 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 almost already taken a quarter of our capacity and we're getting to the getting close to that. We're gonna have to upgrade anyway. And unable to provide any enhancements to the river walk, that was one of the things that the, uh, that the uh, stakeholder group identified. Any questions on that one? Okay. Alternative one was the wet weather resiliency, where we actually increased the, increased the treatment ex expansion up to 11 million gallons a day and to remove the existing garage. Now, what we did with that we actually proposed a CSO tank down where the garage was. We would hold like 500 gallons, 500,000 gallons, and would take that peak flow off 
hold it, then treat it as a storm subsided. We'd also increase uh, elevation across the sites. The driveway would be built up a little bit, um, and we'd still have to put in a new effluent, a new headworks. Headworks is where all the flow comes in, the one that I showed you that was flooding. No matter what we do on any of these alternatives, that needs to be built up. And then in this one, we'd have what we'd call an effluent pump station because all those existing tanks would stay there. Uh, we can't really raise the elevation in any of those tanks. Um, and the fact that those tanks are, are over 50 years old now and some of them are starting to uh, deteriorate. Then we looked at alternative two, which is the Aqua Narita one. We again would increase the treatment capacity up to 11 MGD and it would also accommodate growth in the community. It also calls for nutrient removal. Uh, you folks have seen a lot of algae blooms, everything else going on. So this would actually remove the ammonia and nitrogen from the water and also would remove some phosphorus. We'd demo a lot of those tanks. It would give us more open space for, for future use or growth or for community use. Um, possibly solar panels. I know a lot of the stakeholder group wanted some kind of regenerative energy down there. We would actually raise Front Street you see what we'd actually move the admin building down onto Front Street for public access. We'd also add bathroom facilities for that area, redo the boat launch that would all have to be raised because of the flood, and then we'd have things for the rec department for kayak use and canoe use and those type of things. And we'd also put in what we'd call a primary pump station where we would leave the headworks and pump up to the Aqua Narita. We can now get that elevation almost to any one that we want, five, 10. The Aqua Narita process actually sticks 13 feet out of the air. So we'd actually build it so that we wouldn't have to worry about it too much. And the older buildings would either be repurposed or, or dem demolished. And then finally, alternative three, although alternative two somewhat morphed into three, it was, was what we call the Proteus technology. This is really cutting edge. It's only been used in South Korea to date. It hasn't been into the United States yet. But we could actually put 16 million gallons a day through that thing, do the nutrient removal, and a lot of the same type of things that we talked about with, uh, with uh, alternative one. So with that, we'll go into the site alternatives, and I'll turn it back to Emily. So this is a listing of the metrics that we looked at that were based off of those goals, criteria, and objectives that we were reviewing earlier. And this is the end result of what the measurement was based off of what we looked at each alternative and uh, reviewed our analysis on. So although this just looks like a bunch of numbers, uh, if it has a higher number, the uh, rating was higher, and if it has a lower number, the rating was lower. The goal weights here that you see in the goal weight column actually are part of the AAA process and part of the evaluation perspective. So on the AAA, in the EPA's process, they ask you to rank the goal, uh, the goal with how important it is. And as we discussed, improved system resiliency was the most important. So that was ranked as a 10. Then what you do is you rank all the other goals relative to that top ranked goal. So our stakeholder group identified and our, our water resource team together identified that the, sustainability, the financial sustainability goal was about as 88% as important as the system resiliency goal. And then as we moved here, we saw that the uh, community livability goal was about 86% as important as the improving system resiliency goal and increasing public awareness and more amenities down at the facility was about 70% as important as a goal weight as the improving system resiliency goal. So I can walk through each one of these, but um, at the end of our analysis, you have what's called an unweighted alternative scores and a weighted alternative scores. The unweighted alternative scores just take into account the ranking of each alternative, and the weighted alternative scores factor in the goal weights that we went over here. So as we look through each of these, 
Our alternative one scored a 184.4, our alternative two a 251.6, and alternative three a 309.6. These just really look like numbers to me. I'm not really sure what they mean, so I'll take you to the next slide. So when it was all said and done, um, this is the capital cost of each project. Um, keep in mind that this is carrying a 30% contingency. This was done at a high level view. Um, also carried 10% 10, 10 general condition and overhead and 5% contractor profit. But at the end of the day, we carried the 43 million for the alternative zero if we did nothing. Alternative one, which was a little bit of resiliency upgrade with the existing infrastructure came in, as you can see, just over 36 million. Alternative two at 54.4, and finally alternative three at 70.8 million. So the AAA process asks us to then take these weighted alternative scores and look at the annualized project capital and O&M cost. And there's a little more math behind this that I won't, really won't go into the 2.12 and 2.87 and 3.70, but in a nutshell, you're basically looking at what your capital cost will be and what your operating and maintenance costs will be. And this is 2.12 million, 2.87 million, and 3.7 million. So when we come up with our benefit cost ratio results, we get an 87, an 87.7, and an 83.7. One thing to note is that these two numbers are not far off from each other. We went through this with our Coastal Resiliency Ad Hoc Committee and explained the differences of the alternatives. Um, and since we've actually met with them, they, they really wanted alternative two. But since we've met with them, we've also looked at the alternative two design and it's actually moved closer to some of the efficiencies that we saw in the alternative three design. So, big price tag, there's no question about it. Um, and I guess the question is, where do we go from here? We have engaged the consultant to uh, firm those numbers up. I think we did that as part of the budget process. Although they don't feel comfortable with giving us a real number, it's probably going to be November time frame, um, maybe December. Um, but I don't know. Any suggestions on where we go from here? Do you want to consider a bond, anything like that? I think that's open for discussion. Um, I have looked into some so there's some funding through the Clean Water SRF right now. Um, interest rates are at a historic low at 1%. Um, the main DEP does administer a, a fee for that, which is a half a percent, up to 15 million is some of the consideration. Um, that would be a bond over 30 years. I think another thing to think about too, and this is the most important one I believe, is with Congress talking about infrastructure funding and we, we want to be ready. If something comes up, we're gonna have to have the matching funds. So it's kind of, not to push it, but it, there is a window there that we have, we have to move on. And, and this will be a generational type funding. I don't know if we'll see this again, so. With that, we'll open it up to the questions. Thank you, Director Carter. City Administrator Kenrath. Howard, I don't know if we just want to touch on, you know, just for the council as they uh, consider this, if we were to talk about a bond for this year, just the timeline <coughs> involved there, um, and just that would obviously have to be a significant consideration as, as this body thinks about this question. Um, it's, it's very tight going forward if we're going to make it to this November's ballot. So maybe just a little preview on on timeline for their consideration? Yeah, um, if we were to do this, it's gonna take three council meetings before uh, September 7th. That's when uh, Michelle will need all the stuff for the ballot. So I think if there's something we wanna move forward with, we'd probably introduce the bond to you folks on August 9th. I, I happen to be out of town, but Emily can certainly do that. We'll, we'll engage a bond council to try to get that going. Um, then we could go to public comment on August 26th, 23rd, yeah. 23rd, but then we're gonna need another council meeting, probably right after Labor Day or another one at the end of August. And it's more about early voting and everything. She needs that, that data for the ballots well beforehand. Any questions for 
Councilor Berman. Yeah, thanks. It's a very compelling presentation, and, and the need is really clear. I have a couple of questions about your, your scoring, so I can understand the difference between alternatives two and three a little bit better. And in particular, on your rubric uh, 1.1, alternative three scored better than alternative two in resistance to flooding. And, and I'm curious about why that is. It wasn't clear to me from the design. Well, that, that one was actually higher out of the ground. But since the cost is so much higher, we went back and worked with Aqua and Arita, and we can, we can put their facility higher up in the air to get that flooding elevation back down. Plus, the cost of it was just astronomical. Just you know, 54 was pretty high. 70 was really getting up there. I think we can do that with Alternative 2. We have been engaged in that company, Aqua and Arita. We are going to do a demo of their process at the plant um, sometime in late August. We would spend that kind of money. We want clarity that everything's going to work as, as it is. We, we did go down and look at one in Alabama a couple of weeks ago, and it, it was working beautifully. What we liked about it is that it would take a whole range of flows. We would really like to close that, that CSO on Front Street to finally get us off the CSO list. And it, it takes a lot of things into consideration. It would let us grow out to 2050. We've done a lot of population studies business studies that are all part of this package to make sure that we're going to have all that covered. Because you, we, we, this has got to go at least 30, 40 years. We, we can't have something that we want to come back. At least I wouldn't want to have something to go to bond and come back 10 years from now one another bond. Yeah, right. Also, too, since we did this scoring um, alternative, too, we realized that there were some areas where some of the structures could be raised farther than when we initially did this analysis. So if we were to go back with 2020 is hindsight, right? But if we were to go back now where we're at with, the, with some of the alternative changes we've made to this number two, that might score even higher than it did at this time. Yeah, this was from a May result that we were working on. Yeah, that's the nature of my question. It looks like for, for uh, score 4.1 also, it looks like from your new site plan that alternative two might score a little higher there also because you rearranged some things. And so while well, alternative two was only slightly the preferred version on your final score, it, it may actually be a little higher now if you had gone back to rescore it. Absolutely, as we do a deeper dive into the technologies, that's really the case. Yeah. The score goes higher, the price goes lower. That's what we're <laughs> aiming for. That's right. And then, I, I, though I understand the urgency is, is high, you showed pictures of, of the water cascading. Uh, we're talking about a, a November bond. Is, is there a reason it has to be done in November? Could it wait for a, a June election? Well... I, I don't know. It, it all depends on the funding. A lot of these people want shovel-ready. I think Phil's been a few of these construction projects. People that are shovel-ready tend to get the money through Congress. Is that a given? I don't know. For instance, we went ahead. You've probably heard about the earmarks that they've had in Congress. No. Um, we submitted for the first one for Shelley Pingree's office. They really liked it a lot, but didn't quite make the cut. But we... We worked with uh, Senator King and Senator Collins. We we're, were earmarked on both of the, the two things. We just submitted the admin bill in the first part of the project. That was a $5 million project with the Riverwalk enhancements, and they're both carrying that. Hopefully, if that goes through Congress, we'll at least pick up some money for that. But we've got that close enough, the shovel ready, that we know we could build that this, this coming summer, and we have the match for that. Okay, does approving a bond at our level improve the chances of getting uh, federal funding? Oh, I would believe so, because you already know you have the match. Um, that would be a good, better question for uh, Glennis, but of course she's out, but um, absolutely. And are you looking for feedback on which option, in, in addition to how to pay for it from us, or is, well, is, well, is I, the option? I, I think the option is, the feedback is, do you want to move forward with a bond question, or our other thoughts? That's, that's really what we're up to now. I think... Everybody's pretty comfortable with option two, unless you really want something we can talk about, but we can certainly move forward with that. Appreciate that. Thank you. Councilor Hatch. Uh, yeah, I'd be an advocate for um, moving this forward, uh, that shovel-ready component. I think uh, when you're ready to do something, it's interesting how you can find sometimes find some money that you didn't think you were going to stumble across. I'm a little vague myself, and it's because I'm the new kid on the block here, but uh, can we talk a little bit about bonding capacity and where we are with that and how 
if we bond this project, which I, I have no, no problem with, uh, we also have to remember that we have a school coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suspect that uh, even though the state will fund uh, the construction aspects of that, it's my understanding that it's common practice to bond uh, for a school in order to take care of the things that the state is not funding. So I would really like to have some clarification on, in general, where we are and what our capacity to bond is. Thank you. So in anticipation of that question, I'll just say we already spoke with our auditing firm to get some analysis to provide to you if you choose to go forward with this that we could bring back at our next meeting about um, our current you know, level of debt service, uh, where we would be in relation to our peers, and really how much more do we have you know, on the credit card, so to speak. Because um, we do have competing priorities here. We do have a school to think about. We do have a satellite public safety facility, potentially. Um, and there are a number of priorities before the city. So we already have some initial analysis there that we could bring back um, on August 9th. And if there are more particular questions that you have, please you know, get them to us. Um, and we can get uh, more clarification from our auditing firm. That, that would be uh, very, very helpful. Thank you. Councilor Johnston. Thank you. Yeah, along those same lines, I'm not so much worried about capacity. I mean, ultimately, you know, your municipality, your, your capability is through the tax levy. Uh, but I am concerned along that same line as competing with the school department, because as I've said before, we have to bond the entire amount. Mm -hmm. Then the state kicks back through the EPS formula. So it could be $100 million. This could be 50 to $70 million. Um, and my concern is that you have that perception by the voters that says, well, I just approved 70 million for wastewater. Let's go with the cheap route for the schools. And, you know, as a parent, not one that will have kids at this new school, it is concerning to think that we might shorthand, you know, our children. Um, whereas if this was to pass later on, after we had bonded for that, I don't think there's, you know, there's less competition. Thank yeah, you. And, and we're cognizant of that. We, we know about the school. Um, that's why we're trying to get a, a little closer number, and I think we could probably bond the question to borrow up to, and hopefully by the time, you know, I think you have a certain amount of time, Brian, to use that bond. It may be two years, three years, at least we could have that. And if we don't use all of, say, the 50 million, maybe it only ends up being 30, maybe we can get lucky and get a grant. I don't know. You never know what the way things are going in Washington, so. Councilor McPhail. Thank you. Um, Director Carter, could you just give an idea of the price range being comparable or even less than some of our surrounding communities that have gone through the same process? Um, you know, the oh. price is kind of right on track or even less in some cases than most. Yeah, yeah, there's certainly a lot of construction projects going on. Um, I believe just that CSO tank on the side of 295 in Portland, that alone 70 million. Um, Old Orchard just went to bond for is it 25 million, 26 million to upgrade their treatment plant. Biddeford just passed a bond for 14 million, 15 million to upgrade the, the sewer work. So there's a lot of that going on. Um, Portsmouth is building a suitable, uh, comparable plant that committed 80 million. So there's a, there's a lot of sewer work going on because we're getting into aging infrastructure now. Just the needs in the state of Maine exceed $1 billion of sewer work because that stuff was all put in, figured in the 60s and 70s, and it's coming, coming due. And climate change certainly isn't helping that. Um, so I think ideally we'll work through it. We'd like to pay for some of this through TIFs. I think we can do a good portion of that. Um, we could pay for some of it through impact fees and then hopefully pass the rest on well, not the past, absorb the rest into the enterprise fund and hopefully not even get into the general fund, but we'll have to see how it plays out. Any further questions? Councillor Gunn? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Howard, you uh, mentioned that everybody, or your word is to that effect, were kind of on board with uh, option two. Was uh, any serious discussion uh, put forward about going all the way with option three, and uh, if so, um, what was the uh, nature of the debate so I can kind of gather, you know, where the real consensus was, because, I mean, if we look at this, obviously, it's quite a bit of money for uh, option three, but in terms of uh, 
you know, having the best long-term results and perhaps not, not having to go back to bond, like you said, in 20, 30 years, depending on how bad uh, uh, the climate change has an effect on the uh, Sauk River estuary, it might be something uh, prudent to at least consider, at least some hybrid of it. So what has been the discussion between two and three? Well, with option two and three aren't really all that much different. We, option three was appealing because it would take a peak flow a little bit more, but the, the fact is that was still a technology that hasn't left Korea. They were not willing to give the engineering firm any structural drawings, and they were kind of a little nervous about that. Here's your equipment, you design the tank to put it in. And <laughs> that didn't go over real good. But I think with option two, there's a great big one in Dublin. They're all over Europe. I think we now got six or seven of them in the United States. There's no additional media with it, and we feel a lot safer about that. And there's actually a, a demo for demo plan that we're going to bring up that we're going to actually have on site and we're going to run for three months. That, we wouldn't have been able to get anything from the Koreans on that one. Although, in the beginning it looked real good when we come out, but as we went through it, it wasn't quite as appealing. Our stakeholders also said that they would like solar panels and um, it was important to have public green space access making sure that we had future capacity to use the site, meaning uh, as far as acreage on the site. Uh, there was also discussion about making sure that we accurately accounted for population growth. So one thing we've been doing is going back, determining uh, what we can handle on the site in the future, and hopefully getting that even a little higher than this. Uh, and then as far as the green space, where, where solar will fit on the site and how we can uh, make some energy savings for the long term on, within the facility. Yeah, there was, there was a lot of support for the, the river walk. I don't know how many of you folks have been down there, but that's used quite heavily in, in a bathroom facility and other things w would be good. And we, maybe even we have some kind of teaching element down there how to do with stormwater and other things that we could build in the, into the uh, admin bill, especially if we can get one of those grants from, the, from one of the senators. So. Any further questions, discussion? City Administrator Kenrath. Thank you. So just so we're clear, um, I think we need some kind of direction tonight. Because if we are going to go forward with this process of getting a bond placed this year, that means we have to hit go for our next meeting and add a meeting um, for this month in order to hit the, the date of uh, September 7th to get it on the ballot. So um, I think we're just looking for some clear direction tonight on, on what to do. And if uh, the decision is, is go for the bond, then, we'll, then our next meeting will begin that process and present to you some of the analysis from our auditing firm, um, and Emily and I can do that however we'll be out that time, and then we'll, we'll go from there. But we just need, I think, a, a um, consensus here to, uh, to move forward because the time uh, is of the essence. Councilor Berman. Uh, I would favor uh, moving forward with a discussion on our bonding capacity and what a bond would look like, in including adding a meeting to get it done if needed. Yeah, we, we would have to engage the bond council as early as tomorrow to try to get something ready for the... Uh, for the nine. But this would have to be a first reading. At our next yeah, meeting. it would. It would so it not, wouldn't just be a discussion, this would be a first reading. It would be the first to. reading from the Bond Council, then you'd have the public hearing, which I'm sure you're going to have both sides, and then, and then you'd have a final vote. It would probably be right after Labor Day, I would assume. Councillor Purdy. I am just going to express my support for getting the ball rolling on this. I, mean, I don't think we can uh, afford to wait. Let's get moving on it. Thank you. Councilor Hatch. I would uh, join that sentiment as well. I would uh, encourage us to move forward on bonding. Any other comments? <clears throat> Councilor Johnston. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a bit much to digest seeing this for the first time. So obviously, moving forward, we'll have more information um, you know, and ultimately, I believe in a democratic process. So. The voters approve it, and they approve it. Thank you. Is there someone who would like to be the council resource? Since uh, Council McPhail was on the Coastal Resiliency Committee, would you like to be the liaison? Yes, please. Thank you. <clears throat> so we will have that for our first reading uh, on the night. <clears throat> Thank you very much.
With that, we move on to item 11, administrative updates City Administrator Canrath. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, a reminder again, nomination petitions are due on September 3rd and they are available as of today for the following offices, City Council Wards 1, 3, and 6 for a three-year term, School Board Wards 1, 3, 5, and 7 for a three-year term, uh, and Wardens and Clerks for Wards 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Uh, a two-year term, again, 35 registered voters are required to sign, and those are due to the clerk's office Friday, September 3rd at 4 p.m. Uh, National Night Out will be returning this year uh, after being absent last year to uh, the C.K. Burns School from 5 to 8 p.m. on August 3rd. Um, encourage everyone to attend. If you are interested in helping out with the event, please contact Amelia Meyer uh, in Saco Parks and Rec. I'd like to take an opportunity to welcome three new members of our fire department, who have uh, begun their careers uh, here in Saco. It was effective July 12th, and their regular shift assignments will begin this week. Uh, we'd like to welcome Laura Gway, Taylor Bates, and Christopher Lawson, um, who will be a great addition to our team. Uh, and we we'll welcome them and wish them uh, great success along careers here with Saco FD. Uh, a reminder, uh, MMA will be holding a workshop at the Ramada Inn on August 18th from 4 to 8 p.m. Um, for elected officials. If you are interested in attending, please let uh, Tori Gorman know and we will get you registered and signed up. Again, that was August 18th um, from 4 to 8 p.m. And I think there will be some sort of um, food or light dinner provided. So let us know. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for City Administrator Canrath? Moving on to item 12, council discussion and comment. Any council discussion and comment tonight? Councilor Hatch, then Councilor Johnston. Councilor Hatch. I, I would just like an update on the tax write-off program, where we are with that, uh, Brian. Yes, yeah, so we're currently working with Age Friendly and Gene Saunders to develop um, a new ordinance to bring forward. We anticipate that coming before council um, in August. We're just doing some, some research uh, with some other communities, what they're doing and how best to handle this. Um, we are working closely with Age Friendly, um, and we'll anticipate having a meeting with uh, Gene Saunders from Age Friendly um, in the next week or two, and then bring forward this uh, to council at one of our August uh, meeting dates. Councilor Johnston. Thank you. Um, so if we go back to item E, which is the Phillips Springs Road approval that occurred earlier, um, we failed to mentioned the, the method of sale that's required by chapter 81 so I guess in the future we'll, we'll have to have that come back uh, I don't think we even discussed how we were gonna go about selling it thank you Councilor Johnston any further discussion and comment this evening okay moving on to item 13, executive session. Is there a motion to enter executive session? Right. Councilor McPhail. Be it in order that the city council enter an executive session pursuant to MRSA Title I, Chapter 13, Subchapter 1, Section 4056, Real Estate. Motion's been made by Councilor McPhail. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Councilor Hatch. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor Hatch? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6 0 at 7 53 p.m. Uh, <clears throat> we will take a five minute recess uh, before we go into executive session. Five minute recess.
Okay, looks like everybody's back, so we'll start up again. Is there a motion to exit executive session? So moved. Councilor Johnston, is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Hatch. Uh, discussion? Roll call vote. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor Hatch? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6 0 to come out of executive session at 8 33 p.m. There's no report from executive session. Brings us to item 15 adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Councilor Johnston, is there a second? Second. Councilor Hatch, any discussion? Roll call on adjournment. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Berman? Yes. Councilor Hatch? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. Councilor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 6-0 to adjourn at 8.34 p.m. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening.